Can I welcome members to the 14th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, I've had uh, one apology today, that's from Alison Harris. Um, can I first of all welcome uh, the Minister to the meeting. And uh, before the evidence session begins, there's one piece of business the committee must decide first, and that's the decision on taking business in private. Uh, it's proposed the committee takes item five in private, and this item is consideration of the evidence heard in relation to the European uh, Withdrawal Bill. Does the committee agree to take this item in private? Okay. So, agenda item two is the Prescription Scotland Bill, uh, stage one evidence. It's the last of our planned evidence sessions on the bill. Um, we've got before us today the Minister in charge of the bill, Annabel Ewing. Welcome. Uh, she's the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs. And she's accompanied by three Scottish Government uh, officials. Jill Clark, Head of the Civil uh, Law Reform Unit. Uh, Michael Paparakis, Civil Law Policy Manager. And Neil Moji, who's uh, been here before. Uh, Solicitor, Constitution and Civil Law. Welcome to all of you. Um, so I'll open the session. Uh, and we'll just start off with a, a, a general question. Uh, I suppose it's directed uh, at yourself, Minister. Um, if you could just tell us um, why the why the government uh, decided to implement the Scottish Law Commission's uh, report on prescription, and what policy benefits do you think it will bring? Uh, well, good morning. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Um, could I just maybe start by uh, referring members to my entry in the Register of Interest, wherein they will find that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, that I do hold a current practising certificate, albeit that I am not currently practising. The policy objectives behind the prescription bill are to um, ensure that there is clarity and certainty and fairness in the uh, approach to prescription such that, uh, in turn, the issues of legal certainty are very much brought to the fore. And, of course, uh, all these things are balancing acts, but it is hoped that the Bill has secured, through the very hard work of the Scottish Law Commission, uh, working uh, uh, in tandem with many uh, stakeholders during its consultation process, it is hoped that people will consider that the bill has struck that balance as between the, the respective interests of the creditor and the debtor, and meanwhile recognising that there is an overall um, uh, objective to be, uh, uh, to be secured, which is providing legal certainty, uh, which is a benefit to, to wider society. So that, in a nutshell, uh, are, are the, that is the objective of the bill. The law as, as, it, as it stands currently, um, what, what do you think uh, are the, the sort of gaps in that that need to be addressed? Uh, well, the, the Scottish Law Commission um, made uh, various comments in that regard, and, and what they have made clear in, in, in terms of their work on this is that they're not looking at the law of prescription as a whole, they're looking at the law of negative prescription. And they're doing that because issues had arisen which, in their view, needed to be addressed sooner rather than later including in particular the issue to do with discoverability and, and latent defects. And I'm sure probably we're going to get onto that, so I won't belabor the point at, at this stage. But that issues had arisen, that was as a result of a, a Supreme Court ruling which created some confusion as to what people understood to be the, the existing position under Scots law. So, uh, and anticipating other potential problems, the Scot Scottish Law Commission felt that it would be very helpful as their contribution to keeping Scots law under review uh, that these issues were addressed in, in legislation. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. Uh, Minister, um, we know that, uh, that the Scottish Government carried out a, a limited consultation on the proposals on the Bill. Uh, and so, uh, in a previous evidence session, uh, we've got the, uh, uh, Joe Clark had mentioned and gave the list of uh, organisations that were consulted. Can you explain the decision, um, given uh, that, uh, that the Scottish Government consultation might have attracted uh, interest from other organisations and other stakeholders, um, in particular maybe from like, welfare rights organisations? Well, with the <coughs> approach taken thus far to uh, Scottish Law Commission uh, bills which come to the DPLRC and are therefore regarded as being not particularly controversial, and that is kind of the remit of them falling within your jurisdiction, convener. Um, it, it, we adopted the procedure that has already been adopted, so I think this is the fourth such bill, uh, and I'm sure Stuart Millen, who has sat on the committee, will 
uh, be able to give me chapter and verse on all of the other three, but one of which involved my, myself under my current uh, ministerial portfolio duties. That was the Third Party Rights Bill, Succession Bill, and the Counterpart Writing Counterpart Bill. And the procedure has been <coughs> the same with regard to three of those uh, four bills, in that it is the SLC which produces a discussion paper. It then takes on board the views expressed. It then proceeds to consultation on a draft bill. Uh, and then the Scottish Government uh, then will proceed with a targeted consultation, which is in fact the process that happened with regard to the prescription bill. The one exception <clears throat> was the succession uh, legislation, and that was because there had been quite a gap as between the SLC's processes and uh, when we came to be, be looking at legislation in this Parliament. So it was felt that we would require to uh, proceed with a fuller consultation at that time. But this is the pr process that has been followed with these types of bills, and this is the same procedure that we adopted with regard to this bill. So, I mean, just on the, on the organisations that, uh, that the government uh, did consult with, uh, and then, uh, well, it seemed to be quite focused uh, when we put out our uh, call for evidence. Um, we've had other uh, organisations and stakeholders uh, contact us, and uh, certainly I think the, the evidence session uh, that we had uh, last week, um, from, uh, particularly from the Mike Daly at the Government Law Centre, uh, was uh, extremely uh, interesting and certainly, I think, opened up uh, some other uh, avenues for discussion. And um, so, um, so likes of like, the Government Law Centre, uh, welfare rights organisations, uh, Citizens Advice, um, Scotland, um, so were they considered um, before the Scottish Government undertook its consultation? Or, um, or I'm, I'm, just, I'm just keen to try and understand the, the rationale for maybe not Asking it's a consultation, I would have to see the list of all the, the bodies that we as Scottish Government wrote to in terms of the consultation processes that the SLC conducted. Again, I would need to confer back to the sure. list uh, of the initial discussion paper and then the, the draft consultation. Obviously, you know, anybody can respond to a consultation Absolutely. and it's up to them to, to do so mm -hmm. or not as, as they wish. Uh, so I have, I have read the, the, the mm -hmm. evidence session, all, all the evidence sessions in mm -hmm. fact, and I guess we'll get on to the substance of that shortly as well. But in terms of the consultation, uh, it, in terms of the, 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 the number of people that have been engaged, I think there's been really quite a few. And obviously it is open at all times for uh, citizens' advice and others to, to make their views known. I understand as regards to citizens' advice that they may have indicated a while back that they weren't intending to comment on everything, which I think had been the previous position, but had to, to focus on particular issues of concern to them. So, in the end of the day, it's up if individuals wish to, or organisations wish to, to respond to a consultation, then obviously their views are, are most welcome, and it is up to them. We can't force people to respond, it is up to them to do so or not. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Neil. Yeah. I'm relatively new to the committee, so I'm, I'm not sure too au fait with the background of um, consultations that take place in that regard, but I, I mean, I must admit I'm quite concerned about um, consultations that just um, focus on a, you know, a certain group or a certain um, sector. I don't have the list in front of me, but it appears that the consultation is targeted very much at the business community and professional bodies, and given that this is dealing with debts for some people, it's dealing with benefits. Um, uh, I, I, I'm quite surprised that we're not bringing in uh, bodies that would advocate on behalf of people and work on behalf of people who are in that position. Therefore, I just am concerned that the evidence has been taken too narrow because when we had the representatives here last week, they put a different perspective on some of the issues. Um, well, the consultation <coughs> approach that has been adopted with regard to prescription bill has been the same as the other uh, three of the other four DPLRC uh, SLC bills. So that's the, the first point to, to reiterate. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, acting for people with debt, I mean, Solicitors Act for both parties, you know, and I think that was a point made uh, in an evidence session with members of the prof legal profession. I think maybe it was yourself, Mr Finlay, who asked directly, do you represent both sides? And they said, yes, we do. So I think that's important to bear in mind as well. I mean, obviously, you know, we're keen for as wide a consultation as possible. And, and individual stakeholders are absolutely free to, to make their views known. And I'm pleased that you had the evidence session you did last week. We can't force people to submit. Uh, and uh, I think that's, uh, you know, the, the position as it is. But I think it's 
to, to, to characterise all the different bodies that have been involved since the uh, start of the SLC's work. I mean, for example, it includes local authorities. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> I think it's perhaps unfair just to characterise the engagement as just with business and people not representing debtors, because clearly you've already heard evidence to the effect that actually people you have had before you uh, in earlier evidence sessions do represent different parties. You've also had academics. So I think, you know, it's fair to say that there has been a wide uh, reach. Submit to a consultation, you've got to know that it exists. Um, if you uh, like, I uh, think. Well, just a moment. Sorry. And, uh, mm. uh, and also, you know, of course, solicitors represent both sides, but um, the vast majority of people who are in. Uh, who are subject to, say, benefits over payments, council tax debts, um, they'll be represented usually through a welfare rights organisation um, rather than um, a solicitor. Well, uh, one would have to go and get the evidence to quantify all that, I suppose, in broad brush. Uh, that uh, may well be the case. Uh, uh, as to the percentages involved, again, one would need to get the, the statistics uh, to indicate what that was. Uh, but, I mean, it's very clear that the process of engagement, I think, has been wide. As I say, local authorities have been involved and made submissions to the SLC. I would need to go back and check uh, every single organisation that was involved, because I don't have that information at the top of my head. I'd be happy to supply that to the committee. Uh, and, obviously, the committee's role itself in calling for evidence as well has uh, an important role to play in terms of scrutiny. So I think uh, that... Uh, Taking all these approaches, uh, looking at them uh, overall, I think it's fair to say that one will capture uh, all different views uh, as appropriate, and that's quite right and proper. Okay. We won't labour that point uh, any longer. Um, it, I, I think it's, a, it's arisen because we, we, I think we all found uh, last week's evidence session uh, quite uh, very, very useful. Um, so we'll move on to a um, question about uh, section three of the bill. Um, which extends the five-year prescription to all statutory obligations to pay money. Um, the list of exceptions to the general rule lengthened as a result of the consultation process. Um, we acknowledge the SLC's point that the policy choice, and that's between five years or 20 years, uh, is for several reasons not as stark as it first seems, but various stakeholders have suggested to us that the exceptions are essentially political choices for the government and parliament. So can you explain to us the policy rationale for each of the main exceptions listed in section three? Okay, so uh, to say that the list lengthened, I, I, the, this uh, section simply re restates the status quo with regard to these matters, uh, with regard to taxes, with regard to social security benefits, with regard to maintenance payments. So it restates the status quo of the 20 year prescription, Scotland negative prescription. Uh, so I, I don't think it's quite right to characterise it as extending it, uh, uh, because that may be deemed to be interpreted in a slightly different way. As regards um, HMRC and obviously now Revenue Scotland, uh, they had, uh, I understand, put forward to the SLC clear policy objectives, which uh, in their view justified the prescriptive period being negative 20 years, and the SLC uh, uh, accepted their position and that is one of the recommendations and we have accepted all of the recommendations put forward by the SLC, substantive recommendations uh, uh, in their draft bill. Um, uh, this is to do with uh, opportunity to collect uh, and so forth. The uh, social, uh, reserve social security uh, benefits, again that is restating the present position, it is a 20 year negative prescription in Scotland. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it is mirroring what happens uh, in the rest of the UK anyway, because although on the face of it, there's a six year short negative prescription uh, in England and Wales, as far as the DWP is concerned, I think they've made that clear to you in their submission, recent submission of 23 April, uh, that actually uh, they are in a position to pursue well beyond the six year period. Uh, and again, they argue, uh, their arguments, public policy objectives, but also in terms of the, what they say, and I think they reiterated that in their recent submission, uh, they say that in the way in which they seek to recover over payments, uh, taking into account that they can deduct from benefits, taking into account that they um, say that they have a, a particular approach looking at hardship so that they may... Um, uh, 
they may extend the period of repayment over a considerable period of time to, to facilitate uh, individual circumstances. They say that they may have to queue repayment arrangements because a number of benefits may be uh, involved. Uh, and they say that uh, they therefore uh, feel as a matter of public policy that public policy is best served by having the status quo uh, maintained. Uh, maintenance agreements I think to ensure that the money's due uh, 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 from the person required to pay the maintenance uh, obligation is in fact uh, uh, secured and that people are made to uh, take responsibility for their children uh, financially. Uh, uh, and those are the first three. And then the council tax non-dom rates. Uh, at Again, uh, these were representations made by some local authorities to the SLC at the time of its discussion uh, consultation paper, in I think published in February 16. And they argued that, <clears throat> in effect, the public policy considerations governing uh, HMRC and Revenue Scotland were essentially the same for them. Uh, and again, this is the status quo that they asked to be maintained. So it's, 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 it is the position, has been the position, uh, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, what is happening down south, again, I understand that whilst the, the six-year negative prescription, short negative prescription, is apparently in operation, nonetheless, if a liability order is secured within that period of time, then that can be enforced uh, by local authorities elsewhere uh, in the UK uh, without actually limit of time. So I, I think what they are arguing is that this is the status quo, and the public policy considerations for it, uh, and uh, that it uh, ensures, uh, from their perspective, as far as HMRC and the DWP is concerned, that the arrangements are broadly in line with what happens elsewhere in the UK. Yeah. So you're presumably agreeing with the DWP? I think with regard to the DWP, I think what has to be borne in mind is that the, sadly, in my view, and maybe not the view of many members around this table except Mr Arthur and Mr Macmillan, uh, we don't believe that the UK government should have jurisdiction over any uh, benefits. However, sadly, that is still the case. So about 85% of spend... We're not really here to get into that. It was... No, I know, but I'm just trying to explain, if I may. So uh, when you asked the question, do I agree? So I'm just trying to, yeah. to give you an answer. So um, 80, some 85% of spend is still decided uh, for the two rules set uh, for the here. Now, you have the reserve benefits, and then you have the policy which is also reserved about how you operate the, the benefit system. So that too is reserved. And I think it's important to uh, note that they have um, this different system in place in terms of what we propose to do under our new Social Security Agency, which the Parliament passed at stage three last week. So we will have a different approach. But as far as their approach is concerned, uh, what they argue and what they said to you in their letter uh, of 23 April is yeah. that they have this system of, you know, organising how the repayment is to take effect. Also, the grounds of their repayment uh, uh, on which they can seek repayment are, going to, are different to what we are going to be proposing here in Scotland. But if I just could quote briefly one troubling, very troubling small section of their letter, and it was paragraph 13, if I just quote that from the DWP. Uh, it could also lead to a greater pressure, this is if you bring the prescription period forward to five years, it could also lead to a greater pressure to secure full repayments of debt within a five-year period and thus undermine, or at least blunt, the long-established hardship procedures the Department has to balance recovery against welfare needs. This would place debtors in a worse position than they are now if there is an expectation to pay debts off quicker and hence at an increased rate of payment. So, uh, the Scottish Government sadly does not have any jurisdiction over the policy uh, decisions concerning the operation of reserve benefits. That is a matter for Westminster. Uh, and taking that into account, and taking into account what I would say it seems to be a clear uh, shot across the bows here about uh, looking at this issue, I don't want to put these vulnerable people in a worse position as far as uh, reserve benefits are concerned, uh, convener. Uh, I think that would be uh, uh, really extremely unhelpful. And so in that context, uh, I have to uh, look at what the DWP is saying because they are the ones that are in control of the matter. Um, 
Mike Daly, who was in front of us uh, last last week, um, has written a blog uh, on this. Um, I'll just re read out a, a paragraph of that and see if you agree with it. Um, in relation to social security benefits, we believe there's no justification for not having all devolved and reserved benefits subject to the five-year prescription period. It's inequitable that people have a month to appeal a benefit decision while the DWP would have 20 years to pursue reserve benefit debts. What, what would your response be to that? Well, basically, what I've said before, we don't control the way in which the reserve benefits are operated, sadly. That is a matter for the DWP, and I'm sure that many members around this table have individual experiences where that has not been a very positive experience for the constituent, but that is nonetheless the situation that we are presented with. As regards what we hope to do here in Scotland, we hope to do things very differently because we want our social security system to be based on the key principles of dignity, fairness and respect. In that regard, uh, uh, the grounds for recovery of overpayment in Scotland will be different, so it won't include uh, where there has been uh, simply an error on the part of the agency, of the social security agency, rather there would have to be some uh, fault on the part of the recipient or circumstances where you know you you should be aware that there was a mistake if you suddenly get you know a vast sum of money into your account the likelihood is it's not your lucky day that there's a mistake made so that is going to be a, f a key difference in terms of the approach to recovery taken by the new agency social security agency in scotland that is not the position with the dwp again i'm sure many members around this table uh, will have had cases where the dwp is coming back to the recipient for really quite sizable sums of money where they have made the mistake okay and we are going to be adopting a different uh, approach and of course we have jurisdiction over the matter including all aspects of it so we can do something different and finally i would say with regard to the issue of prescription itself i mean if if it is the case that the parliament would be seeking to amend the prescription powers uh, in, in with regard to obligations to repay uh, reserve benefit over payments, then of course that would seem to, to raise issues of legislative competence which the Scottish Government would have to consider uh, very carefully. Okay. Um, I've, I've asked a few questions there, so I'll allow uh, Neil Finlay to come in. He's got a question about council tax. Yeah, in relation to council tax and business rates, um, there appears to be some uncertainty over how councils deal with that. Um, some uh, using five years, others 20. Um, do you accept there is some uncertainty and will the bill resolve those uncertainties? Well, what I understand from the process thus far is that uh, certain councils, some of the larger councils, uh, including Glasgow and, and Fife, uh, South Lan, uh, made representations to the, the February 16 stage of the proceedings on the part of the SLC. Uh, and uh, indicated that they wished to see retention of the status quo, which is 20-year neg negative prescription, uh, and they indicated the public policy considerations they felt were applicable, which basically was reiterating why the HMRC and Revenue Scotland feel that there's a public policy consideration there. Uh, uh, and uh, those were the representations made. Now, obviously, I note that Technical questions have arisen in the committee as to exactly you know, what the current practice is in every single of the 32 local authorities in Scotland. And uh, certainly we will be seeking further information from COSLA, but of course it's entirely appropriate for the committee itself to write to COSLA to seek clarification of these points. So I'm not quite sure. Do you think there's uncertainty or not? What I'm saying is that having listened to, read the evidence of the committee, uh, it, uh, it, from my understanding of the submissions made to the SLC, this is the position that local authorities are seeking. Now, I note that you, Mr Finlay, have suggested that there's, this is not the position throughout every single of the 32 local authorities in Scotland, so we will be seeking clarification, but I would imagine uh, on that and the general public policy considerations that have been raised that the committee may wish to seek clarification from COSLA, but that's up to the committee. Okay. Um, uh, the... The Law Society and others um, say that in relation to council tax that the um, uh, exception for council tax is unfair. Um, it might discourage councils from collecting debts promptly, but also, you know, debt should not be pursued over, you know, decades of time. Um, and, you know, we know that the shorter period in England exists, so... Um, 
it really is a political choice not to extend that. So could you maybe explain the, the reason behind that? Yeah, just pick up a few points. So um, the first of all, this is the status quo. So this has been the position for some time now, OK, that it's been a 20-year negative prescription vis-a-vis -vis council tax and non-DOM rates. Um, secondly, it's not quite correct to say that the position in England is a flat six year and that's it. That's not the case. Uh, they can proceed with liability orders, which then uh, can be enforced uh, without limit of time. So that is important to note. But, sorry, Do you know how often those are? Um, well, I don't have chapter and verse about uh, English uh, court proceedings in front of me. Uh, I guess we can seek to try and obtain information. But that is the fact that uh, liability uh, orders can be uh, pursued. Uh, and in terms of the, the, the political position, this is a request that came from local authorities and indeed some of the largest local authorities in Scotland, including Glasgow and Fife. This was their request that the SLC then reflected upon uh, and made the recommendation as appears currently in the, 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 the legislation, the draft bill, the bill. So that is where we are today. Uh, and uh, if, if it is the case, Mr Finlay, that you're suggesting actually local authorities don't want this to happen, then again, the need to seek clarification from COSLA uh, becomes more yeah, I, imminent. I'm, I'm not here expressing the view of local authorities. Um, there's many things local authorities want uh, that the government ignores. They want more money to run services that, that are currently being cut. So, well, you know, you're, you know, it's as though you're saying that, you know, whatever local authorities ask the Scottish government, they will deliver. Well, you know, self-evidently that's not the case. But what I'm asking about is the um, the issue around the, the the fact that they're going to have a six-year period in England and Wales, and we're going to have a 20-year period in Scotland. Um, yeah, but I've explained that the six-year period is a bit of a misnomer because uh, the six-year period, uh, a liability order, uh, li liability order can be secured, and then there's actually a, 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 it, it can there's be. no limitation in time. So I think uh, it is important. Are you saying that there's going to be no no difference between Scotland and the the, the rest of the UK? Uh, I'm England not, and Wales? Uh, well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the position is analogous to, uh, and to suggest that it's, it's simply six years and then it all stops is not really c quite correct, convenience as to what is happening as a matter of practice in England uh, and Wales. And going back on to the point of local authorities, I mean, the, the, the SLC, as I said, proceeded with a, a, a consultation. Local authorities responded, including some of the largest local authorities in Scotland. Their view was, and they set it out, that for the public policy considerations of HMRC uh, and Tax Reven and Revenue Scotland, that they felt that they required the same uh, approach in order to ensure that uh, they had the opportunity to uh, uh, maintain uh, good order with regard to the obligations owed to them. And if I could say that, obviously, uh, local authorities are uh, very important uh, stakeholders in Scotland, along with many others, and we listen to all views. Uh, in terms of budget, of course, we had uh, proceeded with a fair settlement, £10.7 in the budget that Mr Finlay didn't support, which represented Absolutely. an increase in yeah. income and capital, yeah. notwithstanding the cuts to the Scottish Government budget yeah. from Westminster. So but I think we're probably digressing to another area uh, convener. But that is the position, and I think it would be very important to have further uh, engagement with COSLA just to tease out some of these issues. We yeah. won't get into uh, the budget, Mr Finlay. Well, it's the minister that raises it, uh, um, no, uh, actually, convener. I'm sorry. So, um, um, you know, I think um, we, are, we have had received no evidence that I am aware of from anyone in relation to um, the situation in England. Uh, other than to say, England and Wales, other than to say that they have a six-year period and what has been proposed would be a worse situation than we do have in England and Wales. That's the only evidence that I have heard from people who have come before the committee. Now, if the Minister's using the situation in England and Wales to um, rebut that, then we need evidence from the government that says you know, in England, this is the situation, this is how debt is recovered after the six-year period, this is how many cases are coming forward, and by the way, what we are proposing is a better system. But we have had no evidence of that. If we have the evidence, then I am more than willing to look at that evidence and consider it fairly, because what we want is the fairest possible system. What appears to be being proposed is not the fairest system. I wonder, uh, Minister, if you could... Uh 
perhaps write to us af af after yes, the meeting just ask officials um, on, on this point. We'll try to obtain as much yeah. information as we Ms. can. Mr. Finlay's right. It's the first we've heard of it. Um, our, our, you know, all the evidence we've had is that there's a six-year limit in England and Wales. Um, so this business about liability orders is new to us. Okay. So if you could yes, give we'll us more. Yes, we'll try and obtain as much information as we can. We'll write to the committee. Okay, thank you. Or payments and penalties of reserve social security benefits. Um, uh, can you confirm that um, uh, the exception is within devolved competency of the Scottish Parliament? What, what, when you say the exception, Mr. Finlay, what in relation to the recovery uh, or the, the in relation to the prescription period? Right. Uh, relating to overpayments of reserve benefits. Okay, so I think I had just said a moment ago, but I'll reiterate that as uh, regards the issue of prescriptive periods for obligations concerning overpayment of reserve benefits, if any amendment were to be sought to be made to the status quo, that would raise issues of legislative competence, which the Scottish Government would require to look at very carefully. So I think I'd just... Indicated yeah, because the advice that we've got is that it's, um, it's within devolved competence. Mm -hmm. Well, as I say, we would. That's what I've. But have just you not looked at that already? Said well, with respect, uh, the bill is presented as it is, uh, and for the reasons stated, uh, in particular, the practical uh, issue of the DWP clearly indicating that if it doesn't have this approach, it may have a different approach, and the different approach may not be as uh, beneficial to individual applicants, and obviously. One has to weigh up all issues, including practical impacts uh, of any course of action. But as I say, uh, these, the issue that the member raised, as I had already said a moment ago, uh, raises issues of legislative competence, which would require to be considered very carefully by the Scottish Government. I wonder if I could put that to Mr. Moji, since he's the solicitor. Have you know, is that, have you made had that consideration? As, as your department weighed up potential differences that could emerge in terms of that. The, the, the competence. I think I would, I would just reiterate what the, the min minister said. You're, you're allowed to say yes or no. Well, I, I think it, the uh, amending uh, the current exception does raise issues of legislative competence, which we'd need to consider carefully if, 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 that, uh, if that was to happen. Okay. Um, several stakeholders have suggested that it would be fairer um, for debtors, uh, and we encourage the DWP to be more prompt in its debt recovery if the exception for reserved benefits and tax credits were removed. What do you say to that? What I would say is that that is perhaps unknowable. I mean, in my experience with the DWP, mm -hmm. I have to say, is nothing happens terribly quickly. But uh, having said that, what you know, I can go on is what they have said publicly in their, their memo to uh, I think the committee of 23 April. Um, where, and I read it out, where they seem to be saying that if you were to bring forward, uh, because they have different me technical methods of recovery as well, uh, 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 and uh, different ways of doing that. So uh, if you were to, to bring all this forward to a five-year period, that it could be, therefore, that some of the ways in which they proceed that actually uh, involve uh, a <coughs> mitigating effect for the recipient may no, no longer be available to them and that this therefore could end up having a detrimental effect on the recipient. And I'm sure none of us would want to do something that puts these vulnerable people into a worse position than many of them currently are. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to uh, another area of questioning and that's on forfeiture. Um, we've got a question from Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, Minister, uh, an earlier version of the proposals had a specific exception to, uh, to five-year prescription for forfeiture, uh, mirroring the legislation that applies to England and Wales. Can you explain why this provision was removed, please? Yes. Um, I, my understanding is that, uh, as a matter of technicality, the, uh, the issues with regard to uh, forfeiture, so it's a... It's a once you establish the obligation, which is then subject to the normal prescriptive period, um, the forfeiture uh, allows you to, to enforce that in certain ways. Uh, so in, uh, customs and excise uses, for example, apparently you can seize ships <coughs> and so forth. So uh, this is a, an ancillary element. So basically, if you have, as long as the obligation, the, the, uh, the um, overarching obligation 
uh, in terms of, of uh, whatever you know, data is due, whatever it is, uh, then you will uh, have the ancillary powers of forfeiture. So it actually is a matter of technical drafting. It was considered unnecessary to repeat the exception to the exception. You know, it was there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if the obligation is, is, uh, is persists, then the ancillary powers of enforcement in terms of forfeiture will also persist. So it wasn't deemed necessary to you know, make that point again because that was deemed to be, if you like, axiomatic from the... The, the obligation itself, which was subject to the normal prescription prescription rules. I'm, I'm sure I'm not in explaining this in the best way I can. I'm but legalese here, but that is basically the feeling that it was actually, as a matter of technical drafting, there was no attempt to, uh, to put it this way, there was no attempt to change the outcome. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of technical drafting that it was deemed, from a legal perspective, was not actually to be necessary. So okay. maybe that's a better explanation. So, because certainly, it's, um, uh, but you, mentioned, you mentioned the ship there, um, also that kind of covers an aspect of goods. Uh, but uh, there was uh, certainly the committee, we were uh, in previous discussions, were uh, considering the issue of uh, unpaid taxes. And so we had that kind of the concern that the, that the general exception relating to, to taxes uh, wouldn't cover all situations where forfeiture is actually used in practice and accordingly removing the specific exception might take away the, the opportunity to actually clarify how prescription applies to forfeiture more generally. Okay. Um, well, what I can say to the member is I, I, I understand that the feeling is that actually everything that has needed to be captured has been captured, but what I will do is undertake to go away and have a, a further reflection on that point, convener, uh, and report back. Okay. okay. Uh, Bill Bowman. Good morning. Um, I have some questions on discoverability. Uh, section 5 of the bill sets out the new test associated with the start date for five-year prescription in relation to the obligation to pay damages. The third part of the new test requires the pursuer to know the identity of the defender or defenders before the five-year prescription starts to run. Can you outline how this might work where there is joint and several liability? And we are particularly interested in the situation where other potential defenders were not involved in the, in the neglect but were only linked to the case financially. Okay, starting with the, the, the last point on joint and several liability, I've seen certain references to joint and several liability uh, as regards tenants, for example, with council tax and, and now in, in this instance. Um, the joint and several liability is, is, is a, a general principle of Scots law and, and uh, it, this bill sits alongside Scots law. So this bill is not changing the rules on joint and several liability. This bill is mm -hmm. looking at the narrow focus of negative rules on negative prescription in Scotland. So this bill operates in the context of what already is the position for joint and several liability in Scotland. And therefore, one would look at the facts and circumstances of each case to determine, as regards joint and several liability, what the legal position would be. This bill rather looks at the position from the point of view of negative prescription to determine when uh, the, the, the prescription, when the start date runs, what date the start date runs from, when the uh, prescriptive, relevant prescriptive period comes to an end and so forth. So uh, I'm afraid that this bill is not attempting to deal with all aspects of Scots law, including joint and several liability. It is just dealing with negative prescription. And one would need to look in the instance that Mr Bowman gave uh, to the facts and circumstances of the relevant case to determine what the joint and several liability in that instant case actually was. So where the period starts to run is determined on what then? Where there are well, unknown, it, it, if, um, well, there may be parties. unknown, but if you can identify one, I mean, if you're joint and severally liable, then you know you are liable for uh, the actings of the other. And so, if you can identify, uh, you know, a uh, uh, debtor, then you know you will be able to. Uh, well, in that instance, the, your prescriptive period will start to to run, assuming you've there's been loss. And that has been as a result of an act or a mission of that person, and that person, be it only one of the parties, has been identified. In circumstances where uh, you then are able to identify, in your example, other parties um, uh, in, who were involved in the act or mission, there can be different start dates from which the prescriptive period starts to run. And I think that is clear in the, the bill. So if you discover someone else... Um, who's it, joint and severally liable? Well, uh, not under necessarily joint. If you discover somebody else, it's not a joint and sev severally liable okay. situation because that is subject to the rules on joint and several liability. But if you, you know, if there are various actors involved, various players involved in the, the loss through their acts or omissions, then there can be different start dates. Sorry, I didn't mean to 
conflate the two, but there can be different start dates then for the so you will be able to the go runoff of prescriptive periods. Those who are jointly and severally liable. Uh, well, as I say, the joint and several liability element is, is governed by the, the joint and several mm -hmm. liability rules under Scots law, and you would need to look at those rules to determine in that instant case that you have uh, uh, raised what the position would be. But in terms of the, uh, the, the normal rule, the normal approach of joint and several liability is that if you agree to be joint and several liable, then, uh, or you are deemed to be joint and several liable, then you are joint and several liable, and that's it. So that's, you know, always get legal advice about what obligations you take on in life. Well, okay, so I'm, I'm not disadvantaged by this change here if there's a joint and several liability and then I have to go on to pursue the joint and several liability individuals to get payment. So, so who are you, who, who's joint and several liability? So you're saying to... Uh, I'm saying that... It, um, I'm just getting a bit confused with you. I thought I had got your example, but you've now veered off to... From which perspective? So the prescriptive period will start to run for the benefit of the um, the creditor when three things, in terms of the bill anyway, mm -hmm. as proposed, three things are no, known. One is that there has been loss, injury or damage. Two, that that has resulted from an act or omission of a particular person or persons. And three, you are able to identify who that person or persons Okay, so people I'm making are. a claim. And um, against the person that I think has been the person who's done the damage, shall we say. For some reason, that person doesn't pay or can't pay, and then I want to go against the joint and several partners that I then um, pursue. Is, is there anything in the new law that brings that five-year prescription to, to um, prevent me going against the joint and several individuals um, because I haven't gone after them within the, you know, the five years? Right, okay, I see where you're getting from. Uh, well, uh, why, well I, okay, I, I guess in these hypotheticals, why wouldn't you necessarily know the identity? But taking, taking examples to extremes where, for whatever reason, you may not know the identity of the other uh, parties, um, I mean, you could, uh, I, I guess, adopt our kind of belt and braces approach uh, but the point of this bill is to hope to provide as much legal certainty as it's yes. possible you can't legislate for every single individual case so that G given you, that you're thinking about it is there some further clarity we need well I, i'm certainly happy to uh, again look into that specific example that you just raised there uh, uh, in terms of when then if you so if, if you identify one say there's two people you identify two debtors you identify one of them and for whatever reason, you decide it's certainly not worth proceeding with legal action against them. So you're then sort of trying to find out is there somebody else and you feel that you're running up against the end of the prescriptive period. Uh, 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 so in the extreme case where the joint and several yeah. liability would be such that you, you couldn't possibly identify almost around the same time the second party, which I think would take you to a certainly less common circumstance. But... We shall look into that, okay, Joe. Thank you. We shall. Okay. Thank you. Can I continue? Yeah. Thank uh, you. The committee heard some oral evidence to the effect that the third part of the new test in Section 5 might increase the complexity of law in some situations, including where there are multiple potential defenders as a result of complex contractual or corporate structures. Um, do you accept that this criticism of the new test and is the risk offset by other benefits to it? Well, um, I, I think if we go back to first principles, obviously uh, the, the, the reasoning behind uh, this uh, reformulation of the discoverability test is to uh, uh, seek to facilitate fairness for, the, 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 in this case, the creditor. Uh, and that is balanced with other aspects of the bill, which is looking at the position from the debtor and taking into account the wider public benefit of, of legal, greater legal certainty. So uh, I, I think in the in instant that you've just uh, outlined, Mr Bowman, that in those circumstances you could sue the different uh, debtors at different times. So there shouldn't really be any particular uh, problem. At the present time, what you would do uh, to preserve your prescription period is you would sort of just uh, put out you know, a number of protective writs uh, uh, because you're not entirely sure who you should be suing. Uh, and to that, to, to break the prescriptive period running. And of course, that is not really the, the, the best use of resources for anybody, for either side of that mm -hmm. legal dispute, or, or indeed for the courts and society at large. It's not a very sensible way. There must be better ways to do this. So I think the feeling is on balance that 
this, the option that the SLC, because they did put forward a number of options in the consultation, that the option that has been uh, decided upon by the SLC and represented in this bill is, uh, is a, a reasonable one. And of course, there is uh, a, a, a countervailing uh, issue of the need to, to pursue reasonable diligence. So th there is a kind of uh, already a, a balance written into the, the new rules. And I think that, that it seems to me, reading the, the evidence, that the balance of the evidence suggests that this is a, a solution that is um, certainly an improvement on the current position. Of course, that was, as I say, put into doubt as as a result of the Supreme Court case in, in the Morrison case in 2014, because pe people thought they knew what the rules were and, and found out that actually the rules might be something entirely different. So I think this in introduces uh, appropriate fairness in, into the process, and, uh, and I think it is uh, balanced by the reasonable diligence obligation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I've got a, a question on the start date of 20-year prescription, which is in section eight of the bill. Um, so 20-year prescription, like five-year prescription, starts from the date the obligation becomes enforceable. So for obligations to pay damages, this is currently when the loss, injury or damage occurs. So Section 8 changes the start date of 20-year prescription for the obligation to pay damages. It says the 20-year period should run from the date on which the Defenders Act or omission actually occurred. Um, so this proposed change would be a shift in the law in favour of the defender, clearly, uh, because the new start point would be much earlier than the old one in some cases and would never be later. Um, so in evidence to the committee last week, Mike Daly again um, of the Govan Law Centre suggested that Section 8 was unnecessary. Um, he said each proposal in the bill should be examined on its own policy merits and it's unhelpful to regard the bill as something which has to offer benefits to both pursuers and defenders. How do you respond to that viewpoint? Uh, well, I, I noted uh, Mike Daly's uh, view uh, as I read the, the evidence session of last week. Um, obviously, other people have, have other views, and, and if you read the SLC report where they narrate the nature of their consultation uh, and the nature of how the, the work uh, progressed, I think you'll find that actually thus far in the balance of the evidence that the committee has had before it. The balance of the evidence absolutely supports this uh, provision. Uh, it is indeed uh, recognising the balancing act that, uh, it, that has to uh, strive to, to reach a fair balance as between the interests of both, uh, of both sides to a, a claim and also uh, representing um, the importance of looking at the overall picture in terms of legal certainty, which we discussed as a key objective at your very first question, convener. Uh, and this indeed uh, uh, enhances legal certainty and uh, allows finality. Of course, um, in terms of the earlier uh, start date, which is most likely to be the case as a matter of practice, by looking at the date of the last, uh, the act of remission or last act or omission, uh, it was felt that in many cases the loss can, you know, arise many years down the line, and you know, for the twenty-year prescriptive period to start running long stop to start running from them elongates this whole process quite considerably and also taking into account some years ago uh, that of course um, we decided in Scotland to, to uh, remove the 40 year um, negative prescription from uh, our, our legal system uh, so you know this I think is, is reflecting that feeling that we can't go on indefinitely with having uh, obligations extant uh, and that this improves legal certainty. Um, okay. Um, of course, if we change if we change that start date, um, that runs the risk uh, of, of an increase in some of the harsh cases that we've we've taken evidence on. Um, uh, these these will be where the obligation to pay damages is extinguished without the right ho holder ever having even been aware that that obligation existed at all. Um, so, should this risk um, affect the policy underpinning Section Eight? Well, I, I, I note uh, the, the reference to hard cases, and indeed I note that the committee has been looking at a particular case, which is uh, before the petitions committee, the, the Patterson yeah. case, and I think it has been widely accepted that the, 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 if there is any potential remedy for the Pattersons, it's not to be found under the law of prescription, uh, and that, you know, ultimately, 
um, and a point well made in the SLC and its report that in, in terms of, of uh, seeking to come up with a situation that improves legal certainty, you can't rely on the individual knowledge of any uh, you know, individual uh, creditor. It's, that would not allow you to have a system at all. Uh, and therefore, you have to uh, decide what your system is. And inevitably, at the margins, with any cut-off date, there will be some hard cases. But I think the point has been made by a number of people who have uh, uh, given oral evidence, convener, that you know, hard cases don't make the best law. So, uh, in terms of the Parson case, uh, obviously issues have been raised around the Land Registration Act. Um, I think that the uh, Public Audit and post Legislative Scrutiny Committee is looking at that act, and it may be that there are some uh, areas of improvement there that can be made. Certainly, I meet regularly with the Law Society of Scotland, and I met with them recently, the other week, two weeks ago, I think now, and I did uh, ask them to look at what practice rules may be in place as regards this particular issue about acknowledgement from the keeper and ensuring that the client is aware of that. So there are other issues in train as a result of this case being raised, but as regards the law of prescription, that is not where the solution will be found. Okay, that's, that's clear enough. Um, so, Section 8 of the Bill, uh, some concerns being expressed by stakeholders, including the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, about how it would work in relation to omissions to act and ongoing breaches. Um, can you offer us any reassurance in this regard? Sorry, sorry, sorry I didn't catch the last So, again on Section 8, we've had some concern um, from the Law Society and the Faculty of Ad Advocates about how it would work in relation to omissions to act and ongoing breaches. Okay, um, I, if this is to deal with the general issue about the language of emissions, acts or emissions, particularly the word emissions, um, again, these are terms of art of Scots law, and this bill operates within the general context of, of Scots law. Th these are matters that the courts look at uh, very, very frequently indeed, and I think uh, there was also, uh, from other uh, people who gave evidence and made written submissions a feeling that these were terms of art and that the court actually deals with all this uh, and deals with it very practically and that there wasn't really anything new here by including those particular, that particular phraseology. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to another question. I think that's you, Stuart. Thank you. It's uh, regarding Section 6 uh, of the Bill, and that's uh, regarding the 20-year prescription. Uh, with it no longer being able to be interrupted, but it could be extended, uh, only to allow for ongoing litigation or other proceedings to finish. The SLC suggested uh, in oral evidence that um, any extension of practice will be fairly short, as courts tend to actively uh, manage cases and don't let them drag on. Um, certainly with, uh, with the, the challenges to the, the public sector finances, um, could there be an impact upon the court system? Uh, in the future, uh, if this, uh, uh, in terms of also in terms of longer delays, um, if this were to be uh, the case with that 20 year, but, uh, but also uh, does the possibility of an extension to allow litigation to finish uh, undermine uh, the overall effectiveness of Section 6? Okay, on the first issue, I wouldn't have thought that there was any uh, particular impact likely to, to fall onto the operation of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service as a result of this provision. On the second issue, um, the, 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 what the SLC was very keen to do was to recognise um, the practical situation where you may have, uh, towards the, the end of the 20-year negative prescriptive period, an ongoing court case. And, you know, to say then that, well, I'm sorry, because your case didn't reach the next stage by X date, that's it. So all the work that's gone into that court case, which could be years, uh, suddenly... <coughs> on a very, very arbitrary ground is no longer to be heard. So I think the SLC was desperately trying to find a way to reflect that as a matter of practice, but keep it very tight. So what they have said and reproduced in the, the bill is that um, you would look at uh, whether uh, you would e e extend in effect the period only till such time as the, uh, the actual case, the claim was disposed of or the proceedings were brought to an end because the proceedings could be brought to an end without that particular claim being disposed of. So I think that um, uh, ensures that the uh, extension is, is limited and I think it is only really uh, 
reflecting, you know, as a matter of practice, the, the situation that would pertain in those circumstances. So uh, I, I think that the SLC have got it absolutely right there. Can I just ask you kind of one uh, kind of wee question, and, and I may be stretching this a wee bit, uh, Minister. Just to, in terms of the, the kind of the fairly short uh, kind of length of time, uh, in addition to the 20-year uh, period, um, sitting with uh, your uh, previous um, uh, experience uh, out with uh, Parliament, um, would you be able to kind of provide any indications? To kind of, I mean, if there were to be an extension, I mean, what would the kind of extension kind of normally uh, be? I mean, would it be a few months, or would it be year or, or every case is different I accept uh, but um, or on an average basis every case is different <laughs> I, it's not really possible to, mm. to definitively say because I could say something and then actually down the line there could be a, a different set of circumstances and then mm. you would say that I had you know not given you the correct information so I think it's I think it's fair to say that these circumstances actually will be uh, not common as has been mentioned and it is just trying to reflect that as a matter of practicality what do you do if a case is there 19 years and two months in? Do you just say that's it? You know, when you reach the 20 mark, albeit that case has got another wee bit of time to go, and it was felt that that was not really the, the most appropriate way forward. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, right, I think you've, there's one for you, Mr. Bowman. Thank you, convener. Um, this still on prescription, but on the on property right aspects of it. Um, section 7 of the bill says that the 20-year prescription which applies to certain property rights will no longer be able to be interrupted but can be extended only to allow ongoing litigation to finish. Now, although this mirrors the approach in Section 6 for personal rights, the Faculty of Advocates and supported by other stakeholders has suggested that the approach in Section 7 would not work well for property rights like servitudes. In light of the evidence received, are you minded to reconsider the government's approach to Section 7? Uh, well, what I can say to Ms Bowman is that we have uh, carefully reflected on that. We recognise that the concerns that have been raised and we are reflecting on whether we need to then uh, look at the language to, to make the position clear. So uh, if we feel that the language, having addressed, looked at the, all the concerns, is, is OK, then that would be one thing. But we are going to reflect on that very carefully. So it was a very useful point that was teased out by the evidence sessions. That's work in progress. It is. And can I? So uh, uh, now on final disposal uh, in section 12, um, Brodie's has raised some concerns in its written evidence relating to section 12 of the bill, which defines what a final disposal in, is, in, is in court proceedings. In particular, Brodie says section 12 in its current form does not allow for the possibility that a court or other body will grant leave or permission to appeal late or will to appeal late, sorry, or will allow an appeal to be lodged late. Do you accept that interpretation and are you minded to propose amendments to section twelve? And that's another work in progress. We recognise the the concern that's been raised by Brodies and we're reflecting on the matter carefully. Thanks, Mr. Bowman. So there's a, a couple of areas there yes, that you, you, you may... I mean, if, if, if it's not that we would be against amending it. Just we need to see if we feel that it's, the language is, is, uh, is adequate. If we feel it's not adequate in light of these concerns, we will look at amending it. Yeah. Have you got a time scale for that? Just well, it would be in time for stage, stage two. One. Stage two. Stage one debate. Well, stage one debate. Well, I suppose it depends when the stage one debate is, but I don't, I'm not sure when the stage one debate is. June. It's mid-June. Well, uh, June. Is Sometime it? in June, apparently. Sometime in June. Well, that is so. a long lead-in time. Sometimes it's much shorter, so that should allow us to progress work oh. as expeditiously as possible. Okay, good. All right. Uh, Tom Arthur. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Minister. Before turning to my main line of questioning, I just wish to seek a point of clarification regarding uh, council tax. Would I be correct in understanding that liability orders in England are roughly analogous to summary warrants in Scotland? They may be. I, I wouldn't like to. I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, I referred to my entry in the register. I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. Uh -huh. I, I, I appreciate don't, that. I uh, profess any particular qualification. But I, I think on this issue, as we've um, indicated, we wish to seek to obtain more information. But uh, the fact is that they do have this liability order process. No, I would appreciate that. It's from my, I, as, as a layperson, from my limited understanding, we do seem to have the same objectives. And I was struck at least one website, councilltaxadvisors.co.uk, 
www.ofo.uk, which is accredited by Advice UK, suggests that magistrate courts in England and Wales granted over 3.5 million mm -hmm. council tax liability orders in one year. Quite a few then. So it'd be interesting just to see uh, uh, have a greater understanding of that particular Indeed. method of recovering debt. Um, the area I want to turn to is section 13 of the bill which of course would seek to replace the section 13 of the Act, a, a nice coincidence. Um, this pertains to stand, so-called standstill agreements and would allow for a single extension of the uh, five-year prescription period. Uh, the committee has received um, a range of views on this. Um, there were suggestions that such an, uh, an arrangement by allowing a standstill would uh, risk um, abuse by the economically stronger party in a dispute. On the other hand, there are some stakeholders who are saying that the measures don't go far enough. And indeed, we have taken evidence where there was a suggestion that as the bill stands is fine, but there could be um, additional safeguards, for example, including the, um, the any agreement for a standstill must be in writing and that the debtor must, an obligation must have taken legal or money advice. Now, I appreciate if there's one party saying it doesn't go far enough and another party suggesting it should go further, it may suggest you've found the perfect balance in the middle. But I'd be keen, Minister, to hear your views on um, these various policy arguments that are associated with Section 13. Yeah, so uh, Section 13, uh, again, you know, recognising the balancing interests of, of uh, legal certainty uh, uh, versus... Um, the interests of the creditor in getting a result, if you like. Um, and it was felt that uh, instead of having some um, generally applicable uh, wide uh, provision allowing for extensions of, uh, of uh, the prescriptive period, which would kind of defeat the purpose of seeking to have greater legal certainty, it was felt that having this, what they call a standstill provision, would uh, be helpful in facilitating resolution uh, so that uh, it, it will be available, but in very uh, under specified uh, circumstances. So as Tom Arthur rightly said, so it's to be only for a year's duration. It cannot, that period cannot be extended. And also importantly, it is not to be a general contractual provision. It is to be invoked, if you like, after, it can only arise after the dispute has occurred. So it is very much focused on dispute uh, resolution and I think that is a good thing I think we'd all welcome that that is a good thing and indeed uh, you know we are seeking uh, in, in other areas to facilitate mediation and dispute resolution rather than uh, uh, all actions immediately going uh, straight to court so I think that is the motivation behind it and again it is a balance to be struck in terms of the the, the, the circumstances under which this provision can be uh, uh, invoked uh, in terms of the inequality of arms issue, I mean, it is interesting to note in the SLC's discussions in the report that also there were calls from some to consider restricting uh, the prescriptive period. Uh, and it was felt very much there by uh, uh, some stakeholders that actually in those circumstances you could have uh, 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 circumstances where there might be a, a creditor who is... Uh, uh, less powerful than the, the debtor and that that would involve a real inequality of arms situation. So that was a road that the SLC chose not to go down. But they felt that the standstill provisions for the, the short uh, negative prescription uh, were uh, 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 represented a balance uh, in terms of this overall uh, desire to have a balance between the respective interests. As to the, the final point of the additional safeguards, I mean, I, I noted that in the the evidence of last week's session in particular. And I, I, I had some questions about how that would work on the face of this bill. I mean, it may be, for example, that again, as far as lawyers are concerned, solicitors are concerned, that that would be something that law society should be asked to, to look at in terms of its practice rules. Um, because there may be some issues as to how it fits here. Of course, if you say that you must take legal advice, it may be that, you know, if you are a large organization, uh, I don't know, so there's no inequality of arms, you know, in touch with a large, another large organisation that, although I suppose normally you would have solicitors, but you may use in-house. So does that count? Will you be required to take legal advice? I think, you know, I, I understand the intention here is not to get into that mm -hmm. kind of scenario, but when we're drafting legislation, we have to contemplate as many possible scenarios mm -hmm. as we can. So I, I think what I would say in regard to the last point is it's certainly an issue I'm happy mm -hmm. to go away and reflect upon, but I do feel 
the, as to whether it's on the face of this bill might not be instinctively I feel that might cause certain issues but I'm very happy to go and look at that issue and reflect on it okay um, staying on section 13 um, there's been an argument from uh, the roadies that rather than just allowing uh, for extensions suspensions should be permitted as well what I understand effectively to be a pause um, and there has been various arguments um, do you think there's policy merit in this proposal? Uh, again, having read the genesis of the SLC's work, having read the entire report uh, and all the subsequent uh, submissions, I, I don't feel that this... I, I, I feel that what the, has, the, the, the objective here has, to, has been to seek to find this balance. And I think the standstill with the safeguards employed as set forth to, uh, expressly in, in, on the face of the bill is a better way to do this than a suspension. Uh, and in taking into account the overarching objective of legal certainty, uh, I agree with the SLC that the uh, uh, standstill is a better way of meeting that objective than a suspension as proposed by Brodie's. And in fact, I think the standstill provisions do have quite a, a bit of support. Okay. Uh, just a final question on section 13. There have been uh, various legal practitioners suggesting that section 13 in its current form might raise an issue in relation to contractual limitation clauses. In particular, the fear is that although these clauses are common and important in practice, they might be outlawed due to the current wording in section 13. How would you respond, Minister, to the points that the practitioners are making? Here? Um, I don't. I, I noted the points, but I, I don't feel they're well founded. I mean, the, the contractual. It is quite clear to me that contractual limitation clauses are not effective. This is a bill to do with pres negative prescription. Um, it is important to bear in mind the very important difference uh, in terms of the definition of prescription and the definition of limitation. Prescription concerns the existence of the obligation itself. Limitation is a a procedural issue in terms of at what point you have to pursue the claim and, and, and so forth in terms of, of, uh, of court action. Uh, uh, so the, the two issues are entirely separate and it is quite clear to me that there is no intention at all of impacting on, on contractual limitation uh, at clauses uh, and I also feel that that is quite clear from the face of the bill itself. Okay. My final question is actually concerns with something which is omitted from the bill. We have uh, taken evidence that one potential further reform of the 1973 Act um, could be with regard to the definition of uh, legal disability. Uh, the set, it's defined currently in Section 15 of the 1973 Act as including unsoundness of mind. I think a term that we would probably all agree is somewhat archaic and indeed offensive. Um, I'd, one, one of the suggestions that we have received um, in the course of taking evidence is that the def this definition could be replaced with a definition taken from the uh, Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000. Um, I just wonder, Minister, what your thoughts are on that particular suggestion? Yes, I noted the, the comment, I think it was it. One of the academics, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Russell. Russell. Russell yeah. Um, yes, and I actually uh, I understand that this is a point that is made with regard to other legislation. Again, I would go back to the, 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 the point at issue, which is this is the, the prescription bill dealing with uh, some issues to do with negative prescription. It sits alongside uh, in the context of general Scots law principles. Uh, and if one is seeking to amend general Scots law principles that apply in many other different areas, one would be best to look at that in a different, mm -hmm. uh, through a different vehicle. The danger of, of, um, of seeking to uh, impact uh, basic Scots law principles in other areas uh, and other definitions in, in a bill dealing with a particular area of the law is that there's a risk that one ends up with a bit of a hodgepodge and unintended consequences. Uh, and as regards the particular suggestion, drafting suggestion that one would refer to the adults with incapacity, Legislation. One would need then to consider: Well, at what point does the prescriptive period run? Is it from, uh, is it the, the rules here, or is it to be a different set of rules in terms of when, for example, the guardian is appointed? So you get yourself into a whole other series of issues, and uh, and this is dealing with the negative prescription rules to apply to to general principles of Scots law as they currently stand. If one feels that one wants to amend those other principles. Mm -hmm this bill would not seem to me to be the, the best way to do that 
particularly taking into account, uh, as I say, unintended consequences that can then arise. Okay, thank you. I'll just, I'll just come back on that because, because Dr. Russell um, uh, mentioned the 1973 Act and uh, said that the legal disability is defined in that Act as including unsoundness of mind. That, that was Dr. Russell's evidence. The unsoundness of mind issue is, is the general principle, that, the general concept that I'm talking about. Uh, is, is it defined as that in, the, in that it's Act? It's not defined. It's which gives, sure. Sorry, it's not defined it's in the not. 1973 Act, no. Okay. Which gives the court some flexibility as to how they interpret it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, any further questions from members? No? Um, do you have any closing remarks, Minister? Uh, no, I just I find this very helpful, Convener, and I have uh, noted the power of work that the committee has done thus far and look forward to further uh, engagement with the committee as we go through the next stages, and we will get back to you with the information that we have. Okay. I wonder if I could ask if you could come back to us by May the 11th. So, thank you very much, uh, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave.
Okay, welcome back. Um, agenda item three is the European, U, uh, European Union Withdrawal Bill. Um, so we've got before us uh, Michael Russell, Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe and his officials, uh, Gerald Byrne, Head of Constitutional Policy, Luke McBratney, Legislative Consequences of EU Withdrawal Project, always a mouthful, Mr McBratney, and Graham Fisher, Solicitor and Team Leader, Constitutional and Civil Law Division. Welcome to you all. And Minister, I believe you've got an opening statement. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I thought it would be helpful if I, I laid out the issues in the memorandum as the government sees them. And thank you for your invitation to give evidence here today. This committee will, of course, be central to the programme of work required to prepare Scotland law, Scotland's laws for the shock of EU withdrawal. Work that will be required regardless of the bill being used to get us there work that will be required regardless of whether the UK government and the Scottish government agree about the bill or don't. The Scottish government has always accepted, no matter how much we may regret the UK's decision to leave the EU, that we must prepare responsibly for the prospect of EU withdrawal. But we've also said that that must be done in a way that respects devolution, and we've been working intensely towards that goal for nearly a year now. The Parliament has before it the position of the Scottish government. We've set out, as we see it, the options for proceeding in a way that is compatible with the devolution settlement. Each of those options has its challenges, and we don't shirk from that. Those challenges, however, aren't of our making. The task of preparing for EU withdrawal would, on any scenario and in any parliament, involve an extraordinary level of scale, pace, complexity, uncertainty and risk. There's no doubt it would be done best by cooperation and coordination between the governments, by each respecting the other's responsibilities, by coming together when interests are aligned, and by each being able to make our own preparations where that is required. And I hope we can still achieve that. The right way to do it would be to amend the EU withdrawal bill so that it gives the governments of these islands their proper roles. We've yet to see whether the House of Lords supports the UK government's amendments, but the position of the Scottish government, government is clear and I hope could be supported across the Parliament. And our view has been consistent throughout the process. We propose two approaches to making the changes required, either of which would be sufficient to allow us to recommend consent to the bill. Either we would take out Clause 11 and related provisions and proceed by political agreement, or following the arrangements in the Scotland Act, which require the consent of the Scottish Parliament to any adjustments to competence, temporary or otherwise. And I'm pleased that a set of amendments which would achieve that has now been tabled for House of Lords discussion by Lords Hope and Lord Mackay of Clashfern. This Parliament passed the Continuity Bill overwhelmingly as the best way to prepare for EU withdrawal if agreement can't be reached. The policy memorandum lodged alongside the Continuity Bill sets out various scenarios of how the Parliament could proceed in these circumstances. But given that agreement hasn't yet been reached, Parliament must now finally decide on three things. Whether it agrees with the Scottish Government that the powers set out in Clause 11 and related provisions aren't acceptable, how best in these circumstances to ensure continuity of law in Scotland, and the scope of the powers to ensure that this law operates effectively and supports cooperation between the governments whilst maintaining the rights of the Parliament. Now, it's open to the Scottish Parliament to withhold consent to the EU withdrawal bill, given that alternative arrangements in the form of the continuity bill are in place. Or the Parliament could consent to parts of the withdrawal bill, primarily for the fixing powers of the UK ministers, being able to be used in devolved areas which would allow the governments to cooperate. And a third option would be for Parliament to decide that sufficient changes have been made to the EU withdrawal bill to address the concerns expressed by this committee and the Finance and Constitution Committee. Consent could therefore be given to the whole bill, or bill, the whole bill except for Clause 11 and Schedule 3, the parts that impose new and unwanted restrictions on our devolution settlement. Now, the Government has invited Parliament to consider these options and to set out its views. Legislative consent is, in the end, given or withheld by Parliament, and I look forward to helping Parliament come to that conclusion. As I've said, the UK Government must then put forward amendments to the Bill to reflect the extent and form of the consent provided by this Parliament. That is what our constitutional system requires. Deciding whether to take account of legislation passed by this Parliament, deciding whether to follow the constitutional rules concerned, isn't optional. The UK Government acknowledged that at the outset when it asked for the consent of the Parliament to the Bill, and it must recognise that fact. But whatever the Parliament eventually decides, that shouldn't be the end of the road for this. 
There has to be cooperation and coordination between the governments, given the scale of the task. And we're committed to that cooperation. Thank you, Minister. Um, so I think we'll probably have some gen general questions I've, 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 I've first before we get into the meat of it. Um, so perhaps you could just clarify things for me. You've put options in, in, in front of Parliament uh, in the uh, memorandum. Um, there's three options, and you say that Parliament must finally dis decide. Um, what, what's the timescale for that? Well, the timescale is likely to be the third reading of the bill in the House of Lords. Uh, the, as you will know, uh, convener, of course, the, the regulation requires us to pass or not pass a letter of consent motion uh, at the f but before the final amending stage of the bill. That's anticipated to be the third reading, and that would, is likely to take place on the 16th of May. Now, obviously, that's the House of Lords timetable dictates that, but the 16th of May, and it's our, our intention to uh, have, uh, with the permission of the Parliament, to have the final debate on this in the Parliament on the 15th of May. So it, it will, I think, go to the wire. But as I indicated, tomorrow's um, House of Lords uh, uh, report stage on the devolution clauses is, is very significant, and there are amendments there uh, which could resolve this issue. OK. Uh, when were they tabled? They were tabled... Uh, the, the closing date for tabling was last night. Yeah. Uh, the convention... I've, I've found I have to know a bit about House of Lords procedures, which <laughs> is a bit surprising. The convention is that the government tables a week before the debate, then members are up, up until two days before the debate. So the amendments were obviously finally tabled last night right. and are in the order paper today. There are also amendments in the name of... Jim Wallace and David Wigley, I think, supported by David Steele, that also are helpful. But the amendments tabled by Lords Hope and Lord Mackay are essentially achieve the second of the objectives. Okay. Um, and presumably you, you're, you're going to be having further discussions, as you have been, um, with the UK government and um, maybe the Welsh government as well. There's a JMC meeting tomorrow afternoon in London. Uh, I'm due to be, give evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee tomorrow morning, right. but I hope to be in time to get to a JMC meeting in London tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Um, and could that meeting resolve any outstanding uh, issues, do you think? It certainly could. I mean, you know, one way forward is for the UK government to, to accept the amendments that are in the House of Lords, um, and as we'd indicated, the the amendments that come from Lords Hope and, and Mackay would, would, we think, do the job. Uh, that would be a way forward. Um, and you know, we are looking for that way forward, that, and discussion will continue. Uh, and the JMC will no doubt consider those matters. Okay. So la last week we had a situation <coughs> where the, the Welsh government, who I know you've been working closely with, um, basically agreed with the UK government, and you, you don't. Um, well, why has there been that divergence, do you think? Well, I, I, think I think that would really have to be answered by the Welsh Government. But uh, you know, I think we have to recognise the context in which they're working is one in which Wales voted to leave the EU um, and Scotland didn't vote to leave the EU. So that's a significant difference in our positions. Uh, I think also that the, the, the Welsh uh, have a different system of devolution. They've only moved to uh, the reserved powers system on the 1st of April. Um, they had a conferred powers system before, so they have a different system of devolution. But in the end, of course, there is a political decision to be made, yeah. and the decision that we reached was that the uh, proposals did not meet the, the basic test of consent that we had, and that was confirmed for us when we saw the amendments to the bill, which you know, I think everybody would have to admit were not terribly um, uh, well drafted in terms of securing support. I'll open it up to <coughs> other members if you've got any questions. Yes, Stuart. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, uh, Minister, uh, certainly uh, just in your opening uh, comments, <coughs> excuse me, you opening your comments, I mean, obviously you spoke about the option two and the, the amendments uh, put down by uh, Lord Hope and uh, Lord uh, Mackay. Um, and you also spoke about the, the Scotland Act in Section 30 uh, and the issue of the, of the consent decision, which... Um, in, in the previous uh, parliamentary session, when I uh, was on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and then and the, uh, the Referendum Bill Committee, and, uh, and it was the, that Section 30 process was extremely important 
and uh, and it showed the, the issue of uh, cooperation and coordination between uh, the two governments. And certainly, certainly regarding the Section 30 of the Scotland Act, uh, orders adjusting the competence of the Scottish Parliament must also be passed by this Scottish Parliament. And certainly from uh, my reading of the, the UK Government's amendments to Clause 11, this Parliament uh, sent notice of proposed orders, but uh, they are not subject to any procedure or formal uh, scrutiny here. And do you think that uh, this will provide sufficient scrutiny to this Parliament and also to this committee uh, in terms of decisions which will actually affect the Parliament? No, uh, uh, and that is a, a key point that we, you know, we have to consider in these matters. Um, the root of this difficulty lies in the, uh, in the desire in the, in the EU withdrawal bill to have a second backstop uh, to, to, to be able to uh, uh, overrule this Parliament. There is already process within the Scotland Act. I mean, I, I don't like it. You know, I said frequently, I, I wouldn't want that. But there is a process in the Scotland Act that allows this Parliament to be overruled. That is, you know, at the end of the day, the basis of devolution. That is because Westminster is sovereign according to the, that interpretation. So to put a second backstop in, you know, you have to ask why is this happening? And when that backstop is put in, that in actual fact creates the circumstances that no matter what the Parliament did. It would, be, it would be overruled, is unacceptable. Now, the Section 30 orders require the approval of both parliaments, and that is it, the way to proceed. That is what is written into devolution. And all we are saying is, let's abide by the settlement that exists. And the choice we've laid out is either to take out that second backstop in, uh, in its entirety, which would be then to have a written agreement between the parliaments, or if that is not acceptable, to revert to what already exists. And the Section 30 orders are what already exists. And, and provided we can do that, then the system will work, because that's the system we have. And actually, you know, that system has worked since 1999. This, we've never been in a position where the, the prospect is that the Parliament will be overruled, but that's the position we're in now. So we're saying, I, I think as productively and positively we can, let's revert to the existing system of devolution, uh, which you know, it, it, nobody voted to change. Okay, well, that's helpful. Yeah. Any, other members? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, but I just want it to be absolutely clear on the record that if the amendments that go through this week, uh, Lord Hope and Lord, Lord Clashburn, then that would be sufficient for the Scottish Government. That's absolutely clear. Those were amendments which were sent uh, to, I think, all members of the House of Lords by the First Minister in a letter to the Lord, accompanying a letter to the Lord Speaker at the end of last week. So those amendments are amendments you know, which we have drawn up and which we agree with. Yeah. They have been tabled by you know, two uh, unimpeachable individuals uh, you know, who have been incredibly helpful during this process uh, and you know, with whom I have a great deal of dialogue. And were they to be passed in their entirety, uh, that would resolve the issue. Okay. Um, for, for me and for, uh, for my party, we've been consistent all the way through in supporting the principle of devolution. I don't think um, anyone uh, could say we haven't been, whether that has been in relation to um, the referendum uh, on independence or, or otherwise. We've been absolutely consistent in defending the principle of devolution, and that's where uh, we stand at the moment. And uh, you're right in relation to the uh, Scotland Act, but the reality is that um, there has never been a time when that has been overturned by the UK government uh, and, and long may that continue because that's the, the principle of um, if powers aren't written down then they're devolved is the absolute for me the, the, the red line so uh, uh, I, I think there's a lot of agreement on that uh, um, one thing that has dis did disappoint me off the events of last week was that um, I think all of the parties have worked very closely with you um, through this process. Um, but last week that stopped and we just got a, a, an email saying there's going to be a statement this afternoon and there was no dialogue before that. Indeed, the dialogue happened afterwards. Um, I hope that you have reflected on that and uh, that kind of thing won't happen again because we want to do this uh, collectively as cooperatively as possible and, and when goodwill is there, um, my plea would be, it would be to you not to um, burn that goodwill. And I accept that, and I apologise if that uh, action clearly was one that wasn't uh, as helpful as it should have been in the circumstance. Um, 
I have asked, for example, today, I hope it will be possible to have a conversation with yourself and, and your party leader today, um, who spoke about this issue yesterday. I think it would be helpful to talk to the Liberal Democrats today in advance the JMCEN, and I've, 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 my office is trying to arrange that, as you will know. I'm happy to have a conversation with the representatives of the Conservatives today, if they would like to have that conversation, so that I can go to the JMCEN very clear about what the position across the Parliament is, and I'll continue to make sure that uh, that information is provided, and I am listening to uh, what you say and your party says. Um, in relation to the, um, the 24 areas of disagreement that are still there, um, given that um, only a few months ago it's at 111 and 87 have gone, um, we still have 10 months to go. Um, surely it's not beyond the wit of uh, man and woman to uh, take 10 months or whatever it is to come to agreements on those 24. I, I don't think, to be honest, there will be any great difficulty in that. I mean, you know, this is... The issue is the approval of the frameworks um, and the, the consent that the Parliament gives to what the outcomes are of those. There's been intensive work on those 24. Uh, I don't think it's absolutely right to say they disappeared, the other ones. What's happened is they've moved, they're in categories which do mm -hmm. not require that intensive work because there are either existing arrangements between the governments and the parliaments that deal with it or they don't require it. Um, the, the 24 will require actions of some sort. Um, the question is what sort. Not all will require legislation by any uh, manner of means. There are two outstanding issues, uh, which are the UK government says are uh, reserved matters, um, uh, and the Scottish government says they aren't, uh, and that's a decision we've got to come to. The, the awkwardness in that is the continued view of the UK government that there might be others, as yet unknown, which could be introduced and frameworks established without consent. If we have a consent process, that's not a worry. Because if there are other issues which occur suddenly, uh, and they may, may just suddenly occur uh, and be noticed, then they can be dealt with under a consent process. If, however, the existing uh, the pr process presently on offer was there, then nothing could be done about them. So uh, you know, we are ready for that. But I, I think we can establish effective frameworks in the areas in which we, are, we, we have had c given consent. I don't see a difficulty in doing that. So I think... The general feeling, I think, <laughs> out there in the, in the real world is that people just want politicians to get on with it. Um, and you have said that you don't think there are many problems in terms of working with other parties to come to a sensible workable conclusion. I have to then ask, does the rhetoric stoking up this as a big constitutional conflict help when re the reality seems to be behind the scenes that actually things are probably a lot more calm and sensible than they are being presented by some? Uh, I know that it would be regarded as unusual for me to say that I have avoided rhetoric, but I really have avoided rhetoric um, in the... Minister, I may, not, I may not be aiming well, my fire at you. Well, well, well. in that case, I shall act as a human Unusually. shield Unusually. for the rest of the government and make it absolutely clear that I, I do think that there has been a, an attempt to present not just the problem but also the solutions, and that's what I'm continuing to do. Hmm. I may differ on that. Sorry. Okay. Everyone fine? Tom? You've got yeah, May. Thank yes. you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Minister, you spoke uh, with regards to the drafting of the UK government's amendment being done in such a way that it would make it difficult to secure support. Um, I think it also makes it rather difficult to comprehend as well. Now, you have, uh, and other members of the government have previously characterised the disagreement with the UK government as coming down to essentially whether consent or consult. The use of the word consent in these amendments I find quite alarming because consent suggests um, a power to refuse consent for that to be acknowledged and acted upon. This uh, amendment presented by the UK government seems to express, um, use the term consent decision, which seems to me is a, another way of saying express an opinion. Now, my understanding would be that 
this amendment as tabled actually represents a, a retrograde step because it actually falls short even of consultation. The UK government would be in a position to table statutory instruments, and regardless of whether the Scottish Republic Parliament expressed an opinion or not, and regardless of what opinion was expressed by the Scottish Parliament, that would have no substance or weight. Um, and there's no, as I would understand it, um, implica implications for the UK government in terms of having to justify substantially beyond a written statement the reasons for doing so. Um, I just wonder if you could comment on what your understanding of a, a consent decision is and, and what the implications are potentially for um, the understanding of relationships between the two parliaments and the two governments going forward as a result of this. Well, I mean, my understanding of the consent decision, you know, and we're talking about um, it is it is subsection four of, uh, well, it's 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 subsection two of the first amendment in the name of Lord Callanan on the uh, order paper for the House of Lords, and it's uh, section four of that. And my understanding of it is the first line. Uh, it says, for the purposes of subsection three, a consent decision is a a decision to agree a motion consenting to the layer of the draft. Mm. I think that that laying of the draft, I think that's fine. But the next two parts say that a consent decision is also a decision not to agree a motion consenting to the laying of the draft, or C, a decision to agree a motion refusing to consent to the laying of the draft. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is, at the very least, badly drafted. Um, I think it, it is a drafting which uh, a, a, you know, a minister seeing might have said, look, I don't think that's going to help to conclude this matter. You know, Let's try and understand it. But what it implies is that there is no role for the Scottish Parliament in saying, even unanimously, this is not on. You know, that if, no matter what you do, uh, you're still in the position that you're deemed to have given consent. That is foolish uh, you know, and shouldn't be there. And that's not what anybody could sign up to. So you know, the, uh, let's accentuate the positive. Mm -hmm. The positive is we can amend, uh, and the amendments um, uh, that are in the name of, of Lord Hope and, and Lord Mackay can amend these amendments to make this something to which we can agree. If it's not amended, it can't be agreed to. Yes. <coughs> so it's just on, on that particular point, uh, I think actually following on from uh, Neil Finley's comments in terms of maybe some of the dialogue um, it might not actually be fully reaching the, the population. It might just seem to be uh, a discussion or, a, or an argument between politicians. So in terms of the, this particular amendment, and certainly the subsections 4b and 4c of the amendments, um, can you put that into some kind of clearer language in terms of what, uh, in the future, um, if, if this were to, to, to go through, uh, what the implications would be uh, for Scotland in terms of uh, maybe any of the examples from the, the list of 24 uh, as to how it would affect Scotland? I could take all of the list 24, but I think that would take too much of your time, convener. But let, let's start just with one of the early items on the list on, on agricultural support and farming support. Um, if there was a, uh, a framework established on agricultural support, and if that framework uh, was without consent, uh, then you, would you could have a framework, for example, decided on agricultural support that did not include less favoured area status. Even if we voted as a parliament, unanimously to say, and I think we probably would, you know, to be, to be honest, because anybody who knows Scottish agriculture knows that LFA payments are absolutely essential to sustain Scottish agriculture. Even if we did that, we'd be in a position where they say it doesn't really matter what that view is. We're not going to agree to that. We're going to do something different. Now, there has to be consent. The principle of subsidiarity underpins devolution. And that means decisions are best made closest to where the place that, 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 that is affected by them. And that is what's at risk. And that the quality of life in Scotland uh, you know, does depend in many areas upon that principle being applied. Now, I think we probably need to look right through that list and go from agricultural support to number one to the services directed 24. And in each of them, you can say, you know, without having consent, there are things that could happen here and may happen there that are not desirable. They may well be things to which you know, a UK government, for the best of reasons, believes that you need a different system. But the base of devolution is, you know, that's not how we operate. That's not how we work. Uh, and that's not how we've worked for the last 19 years. Uh, and, you know, the system we have is a system that people of Scotland wanted, and I think they want to keep it. Well, thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. Um, we'll move 
move into the uh, sort of meat of uh, what the committee deals with, um, which is the exercise of powers. You've, pres you, you've got three. We've got three options that you've put forward uh, at the moment. Of course, that could that could all change, but let's deal with things as they are. Um, in terms of the uh, continuity bill, um, uh, what kind of scenario planning is there in, in terms of whether the continuity bill is struck down? Um, and what's the implications if it is? Well, but, well that, that depends upon the decisions that are taken over the next few days, the next few weeks, in terms of what takes place. It depends on what the legislative consent motion is. Uh, but you know, we remain very confident that the, the, the continuity bill is perfectly competent. Uh, of course, the process would be, uh, rather than striking down, you know, the question would be, are there things in the continuity bill which should not be there? I mean, that, you know, the, the, the judgment of the Supreme Court might be that. We think it won't be. We, we are very confident it won't be. And therefore, we would have to examine it at the time. But at the present moment, we believe this, the continuity bill is right. It works well. The question here is, how much of it, is it all to be used? Is it to be used partially? Is it used to be not at all? That's the issue. So just so the committee's clear, are you scenario planning? I'm not preparing for failure in the Supreme Court. But if uh, you know, we will we, we will meet every set of circumstances as it arises. But we're not preparing for failure in the Supreme Court. Okay. Okay. So back back to the question. Um, three options. Um, so of those options, which which mix of powers in each of those three options will best secure an accurate and functioning statute book by the 29th of March 2019? Um, in your view. I think all of them can achieve that. I think that the, the question, Kavina, is exactly the right question. This breaks down into three things that need to be achieved. The first of which is continuity. That is to make sure that the laws work. The second of which is to make sure that the powers exist for that to happen. That is the powers for ministers. And the third of which is to set up the frameworks and the functions that need to exist uh, post-Brexit uh, to allow these things to happen. So the question on all of these is how do they conform to them? And the answer is all of them do, to a greater or lesser extent. Mm -hmm. All of them can work in that way. The question is what would what would work most effectively and most efficiently? And uh, you know, my own view is that we can work any of them. Um, we've always said that the most desirable outcome of this is to have a single statute. Yeah which allows the two governments to work effectively together. And that's uh, less work than it would other be. There's a massive amount of work no matter what. Uh, so if we could achieve that, that would be the best outcome. If that can't be achieved, then there is a mix of possibilities. Uh, you know, for example, uh, to, to uh, the Continuity Bill plus Clause 7 would allow the first objective, uh, you know, that, that is to make sure that the, the, the powers come back, uh, to allow cooperation between ministers, because it would empower ministers, UK ministers, to act in devolved areas, and we could work together on those things. So that's workable. Mm -hmm. The EU withdrawal bill minus clause 11 um, would, would, would be workable because all the, the first two objectives would be met, but the third one we would deal with ourselves. Um, and the continuity bill is workable. It was backed by this parliament, 95 votes to 32. So the parliament believes it's a workable solution, and it's a solution that we can bring in. So the choice would have to be made, but there's no doubt that the first preference has been all along to get an agreement that allows the EU withdrawal will to operate. So your first preference is actually to have none of the three it, options? It, well, it, it is the option, as I described it, to give complete consent. Yeah. You know, and that, that would be the first option. And thereafter, there are choices. But we've, we've tried to do the proper thing by being prepared in any set of circumstances, and that's what these do. OK. So that, that option of giving consent to the UK bill could be before the Parliament on... Mm. I think you said the 15th? Yes, um, it, it could be, yes. It, it could be if there is an agreement and the amendments tomorrow for it to go through or another form of agreement. Yes, it could be. Right. OK. Uh, Mr Finlay, I think you've got another question. Any indication as to the government's view on the two amend on the amendments that's come forward? The UK government's uh -huh. view? No. I have no view on that. And I, uh, None as yet. There's a JMC tomorrow which is when the House of Lords is meeting, so it could be I'll, you know, we'll hear that, and then, and it would be helpful to know that. Yeah. Uh, one of the obvious concerns for businesses and for many others is uh, the whole issue of legal certainty. Mm -hmm. 
I can't help but think just instinctively that the the sort of mongrel option is not fulfilling people with huge confidence and certainty. Do you think is that a fair comment or an unfair comment? Whatever is going to happen, this is difficult. You know, and, and as I indicated, it's not of our making. We will. I would like to provide as much certainty as possible. I think any of these perform the functions that need to be done. The three functions I've declared. Um, it is perhaps simpler to understand the two, two extremes of it. One is a continuity bill where we just take the whole responsibility and we do it, and we've got legislation that allows us to do it, or we agree to the UK bill providing you know, we, we settle the difficulty that exists. Those are probably the clearest options. But the other options are workable. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't come to the Parliament with a list of consent memorandum unless I thought it could produce a functioning result. But the clarity of, of those two, this has dragged on a long time. You know, but of course, the timetable for the EU withdrawal bill again has not been of our making. You know, that is entirely in the hands of Westminster. The, the, the EU withdrawal bill was being discussed at the JMC as far back as, well, it was announced at the Tory party conference in September 2016. Uh, it was being discussed at the JMC, the f I think the first JMC in, in, in November 2016, Ian would have mentioned it. It was certainly discussed at the second one in December, because I remember a conversation in the margins of the meeting with Ben Gummer about it, who was then responsible for it. And it's been on the go since then. So that uncertainty is a product of that time scale. And, um in terms of the way in which the Parliament operates, um, uh, we want to ensure that there's scrutiny of any proposals and proposed changes. Um, which of the options do you think provides us with the maximum scrutiny for any change that will happen? All of them because we would intend, because the, the issue of scrutiny is also an issue of standing orders of this Parliament, and because I think you have already seen uh, draft proposals in terms of, of scrutiny, protocols. Uh, uh, protocols, yes. We would intend to, to apply those enhanced protocols no matter the, the, what is, uh, what, what's here, because I don't think the decision on how this parliament scrutinises, uh, in the end, the detail of that is a matter for Westminster legislation. Um, it's a matter for this parliament to decide. And therefore, enhanced scrutiny is a commitment we made uh, in as the process of the continuity bill went through, and we're going to stick to it. And then, uh, as a follow-on for that, um, obviously the Parliament um, uh, values uh, engagement with stakeholders, outside bodies, etc. <coughs> um, is, there the, is there a similar commitment on ensuring that we continue, when there are changes to regulations or whatever, then um, uh, that that commitment to scrutiny will apply to whatever the option is. Yes, because that was built into the process that passed through the continuity bill, and that is the, the process which we wish to see applied. And that was discussed, uh, certainly discussed at stage two, in so as I can remember anything that was discussed in the 11 hours of stage two, it was certainly discussed at stage two and is built into the, 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 the process thereafter and to the, the role of this committee in that process, which is actually central to the process. Okay. Okay. Stuart. Now, Minister, uh, the supplementary LCM talks about the, the practical difficulties which uh, will arise if reliance is placed solely uh, on the powers of the continuity bill. Can you provide some further information on that, please? Um, they were set out quite clearly in, in paragraphs 19 and 20 of the policy memorandum to the continuity bill, and I'm, I'm quite sure that is, is available. Um, we pointed out that the complexity is added to when we're not able to rely upon the joint activity between... Uh, the, the, two, the two sets of ministers and the two governments. Uh, it would require a, a large number of technical instruments to be laid and scrutinised here, whilst the same provision was being made in the UK Parliament, and clearly just for reasons of efficiency, that would be better done um, jointly. Um, we'd like to coordinate those. Uh, that complexity would flow from actually the inability of the UK government to come to an agreement on this matter, and that would be regrettable. Uh, but we could do it. I mean, we'd have to do it. There is a... I think I said on a previous occasion at this committee, you know, there isn't an option on this. This has to be done. Uh, the, if there is a transition period, and, and, and that seems likely at the moment, then the period of time in which this should be done is not, fortunately, between now and the end of March next year, but between now and the end of December 2020. So that's a big job. Um, our estimate, as, as I think I've also said at this committee before, is 
300 to 350, but that's only an estimate, uh, which is about the whole annual crop uh, of, of statutory instruments. So you would take a year's worth of statutory instruments and have to do that, probably from about this summer, I would have thought. I'm just looking for officials. Yeah, probably from about this summer uh, through until the end of 2020. So that's a, that's a big job. That's two years uh, to, so, to, to do so. So an increase of 50%, but it can be done. It will have to be done. Um, so also in the paragraph 17 of Annex D uh, to the supplementary LCM states that uh, where both governments have corresponding powers to make fixes in uh, devolved areas, the ability uh, of Scottish ministers to make subsequent different uh, provision uh, than that made by UK ministers will protect devolved interests. Uh, what uh, will the impact of uh, subsequent changes uh, to legislation be, for example, in relation to certainty of retained EU law? I think I'm probably going to ask um, a Luke to address that one. I think the important thing about that option is that if the two governments retained the ability to do something different, this ought to, in most circumstances, prevent that having to happen. The, the, the fact of corresponding and equal powers existing would um, ensure that each government respected the rules. It would, in fact, ensure that uh, uh, the situation where we were seeking to reverse a change that the UK government made in a devolved area never came about. I've spoken with the committee about Section 57 of the Scotland Act before, principally in terms of how it provides for scrutiny of these instruments. But actually, by far the more uh, significant part of that is the bit between the Scottish and UK governments. The way that Section 57, which is an existing example of corresponding and equal powers, works is that very often it is, in fact, the Scottish Government going to the UK Government with a proposal suggesting that things would be better done on a UK-wide basis. Um, and because we could always choose to do something differently later if we wanted to, Section 57 regulations are invariably the product of agreement between <coughs> the governments. And that's the, the situation that we envisage in paragraph 17 of the Annex to the Supplementary Consent Memorandum. Okay. Just, just to add to that, one of the protocols, the draft protocols that you've seen is intended to govern that position and give the Parliament a role in scrutinising proposals from the Scottish Government to consent to UK-wide orders in those circumstances. So that's the other one of the other limbs of uh, ensuring the role of the Parliament in, in the, the position we envisage where we might be looking for a, a UK-wide order. So I think that's important to look at the detail of that protocol. Once again, it takes us back to that uh, the nub uh, of this issue in terms of consent uh, of this Parliament and uh, this Parliament providing that consent uh, if it decides to do so. Yeah. And it, uh, although it's not written into the statute, you would have the opportunity to, cons to, to scrutinise Scottish ministers' proposals to consent effectively to UK-wide orders. Again, that's not a statutory requirement, but because of the mechanisms that Luke's describes as alternatives, mm -hmm. we have confidence that there would always be a process of agreement um, under the powers as they've, as they've been equalised under the proposed amendments to the bill. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, and the final question is, uh, in light of the, the differences uh, in the, uh, the UK government and Scottish government's views as to the, the limits of the, the Scottish Parliament and Scottish government's devolved competence, uh, how do you envisage uh, agreement uh, will be reached on which areas the Scottish ministers may legislate for under uh, the bills? in a way which avoids potential challenges to instruments laid uh, by the Scottish ministers? Well, the matter will be resolved, uh, should it require to be resolved, in the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, that, that process is now underway, and I, you know, all I can do is, is say that that will be you know, vigorously uh, pursued by, uh, by, by the Lord Advocate. Uh, you know, we would much rather see all these circumstances pursued by cooperation and agreement, you know, that's been our wish from the beginning. It continues to be our wish. Uh, but the legal certainty will come if it requires to come you know, as a result of the Supreme Court. Okay. Thank you. Bill Bowen, convener. Um, the, the supplementary LCM mentions changes made to the UK bill, which address concerns about the breadth of powers in the bill. Can you say a bit more about these changes and how they address those concerns? Yeah, the UK government has introduced amendments which, which make some changes. You know, as we anticipated that would be the case, they've removed Clause 8, the power to implement uh, international obligations. They've removed the ability to set up new public authorities. They're preventing the powers being used to introduce new fees. They're preventing the withdrawal agreement power from being used to amend the withdrawal bill itself. 
and they're introducing the need for explanatory statements. Some of those things, of course, are continuity bill, for example, in the explanatory statements. Uh, we were engaged with and we do go a bit further and you know, we can talk about that perhaps uh, if you like. Uh, we think those amendments go some way to addressing the concerns that, that existed and some of those things have uh, arisen as a result of the continuity bill and some have arisen because the continuity bill reflected views about difficulties with the withdrawal bill. So there's, there's been welcome change. I mean, nobody would deny that. Okay. One of the committee's recommendations in its report on the LCM from last November was that further consideration be given to basing the powers in the bill on a test of necessity rather than of appropriateness. Now, we, we understand that a non-government amendment which makes such a change for the exercise of UK ministers' powers in the bill has been made at the report stage in the House of Lords. Um, do you plan to recommend an equivalent change to Scottish ministers' powers under the UK bill? Uh, well, we, we have that in the continuity bill, of course, and, and we accepted that in the continuity bill. And indeed, um, you know, we assisted on amendments throughout the bill uh, to, to put that into place. Uh, the position would be one of equity, whatever the powers are granted to the UK ministers, and however they are restrained, the equivalent power should apply uh, to Scottish ministers. We thought that we'd got this into a better position in the continuity bill, so we'd welcome uh, the amendment, I think it's from Lord Lisvane, um, and you know, were that amendment to succeed, we don't know what the UK government position would be on it, were that amendment to succeed, then quite clearly we want to see that the change is made and will be made to the, the powers of, of Scottish ministers as well. So does that mean you would recommend an equivalent? Y yes, I mean, yes. because we, we, we put it into, we agreed to put it into the continuity bill, so we're, mm -hmm. we think it's a good but thing. You might just have forgotten. Yeah, well, indeed, we'd like to be consistent if we can be. To be fair to you, uh, Mr. Bowman, you haven't uh, been here for all the sessions, and it's certainly been covered by this committee. Um, so we we recommended a, a change to the parliamentary procedure for the power in Schedule 4 to create or increase fees and charges in connection with fun functions which public bodies in the UK take on exit day. The recommendation was that the power be subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, not just for new fees, but also for significant increases to existing fees. Do you know of any uh, pending amendments to the UK bill to make that change? I think the UK government are going to, prom to, to promote an amendment in that way. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, the supplementary LCM uh, mentions changes proposed uh, to the UK bill to extend the requirements for explanatory statements to Scottish ministers. Uh, uh, for regulations laid in the Scottish Parliament. Can you outline what the new requirements will be? Yes, I mean, we're, we're very supportive of explanatory statements and we're glad this has moved. I, I'll say in a moment the Continuity Bill has actually still got some additional elements in it which we are going to apply, but the, they include it when exercising powers under Schedule 2, a statement of the good reasons for the use of the power, which I think is very welcome, and, the, and that the use is a reasonable course of action, a statement of, of the amendments that are being made to the Equality Act and that the ministers have due regard to them. Um, a statement explaining the instrument, the relevant law before exit day, the instrument's effect on retained EU law, the purpose of the instrument. Uh, if they're exercising the powers in Schedule 2 to create a criminal offence, a statement of the good reasons for creating a criminal offence and of the sentence attached. We'll make an instrument under the urgent procedure, a statement of the reasons for the declaration of urgency, and where it's amending regulations under Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act, a statement of the good reasons for the modification, that it is a reasonable course of action, explaining the instrument, the relevant law before exit day, the instrument's effect. Now, we committed to providing some further information statements under the Continuity Bill. For example, a statement about whether the regulations affected employment or health and safety matters. Those were amendments, I think, that came from Labour members during the bill. And we're going to be held to that, uh, even if the continuity bill do, is not in effect. We think that the additional information is useful to have. So that would be uh, within these statements. OK, thank you. Um, Tom Arthur. Thank you, convener. Um, I just wish to pick, pick up Minister from a tail end of um, Neil Finlay's line of questioning earlier, in which the um, subject of the protocols was touched upon. Um, I just wish, wonder if you could state for the record whether you think these protocols are workable, uh, sufficient, and whether or not the government is content with them. Yes, uh, I mean, they're a product of discussion with the Parliament. I mean, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I'm very, very keen to stress that these are not Scottish government protocols. These are protocols that the Parliament would take on, and we suggested this 
um, some considerable time ago, I seem to remember last autumn, I think, uh, 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 brought, uh, I suggested uh, at a committee meeting that we should take this issue forward. And I'm glad it has gone forward. And I'm grateful to the Parliament and to this committee for being involved in it. Uh, they give the necessary flexibility to make procedural changes. Uh, they create a higher level of scrutiny that's other, uh, that otherwise would be in the bill. Um, and they also, and this has been, this has been quite an, uh, an important issue, they, they give an effective steer about what matters are considered more important than others. I mean, this is going to be a matter of prioritisation of activity. Um, so they don't supplant the work of this committee, they enhance the work of this committee, and they help this committee, I hope, to make decisions about what the most important issues are when there, is, there will be you know, a flood of secondary legislation uh, coming down the road. So I think this is good joint working. Um, and, and because it's taken some time, there's been a lot of thinking gone into it. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I hope that these are going to be welcomed finally when they're you know, out of draft form by this committee, by the parliament, and certainly will be welcomed by the government. And they, they mean that there is more effective scrutiny. Uh, and they mean that the parliament has ownership of the way in which that takes place. And with regard to uh, all eventualities, um, would you be in favour of a SIF process applying to SSIs that are laid by the UK government? And if so, how do you think that would be achieved? It's, it, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, view. We ca the UK government should not be legislating on how this parliament scrutinises issues. Um, I would want to see anything that has effect in Scotland being effectively scrutinised. Now, you know, the, the sifting process is the process which the, the continuity bill came to an agreement about it. After a great deal of discussion, I, Ross Greer's amendment worked by this committee came to a conclusion about how it should operate. My view is it should operate on all the material that will have effect in Scotland for which this parliament is responsible. I cannot, however, take you know, any responsibility for what the UK Parliament chooses to do with issues that are relevant to it. But I think in general, what we have put in place in the Continuity Bill is a effective and better system which will work well for us. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so we've just got 10 months to go before exit day. Um, it's a very short time. Uh, are we going to be able to deliver the programme of secondary legislation? In that, time, in that time frame? I, I think, Convener, I'm going to use the word we. Uh, we all will we, have to yes. do that. Uh, you know, th this committee has an enormous role, and I, I, you know, I don't apologise, but I do, do accept that this is an en going to be a big pressure upon you. But we are all going to have to do that, because we have to give, as Mr Finlay has indicated, the legal certainty uh, to Scotland, to every part of Scotland, to every community, to every interest group, to every business, that this can be done, and therefore we have to do it. Okay. Um, so, any final questions from members, Mr. Finlay? Just, just on that, um, just a very practical thing: is there be is there additional recruitment going on within government for this, within the Parliament for this? I, I can't speak for the Parliament. Resource? Well, I, I can't speak for the Parliament, but for the government, there has been a, 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 an increase in the number of people who are working with us. Uh, each area of government is looking at this on its own too. Um, there is a resource available, of course, from the UK government, which is allocated resource for additional Brexit work, and you know it's for Mr. Mackay to to account for that. But that money will have to be drawn down. There will have to be additional resource in place, and that's what we're trying to do. And is there a? Can you quantify that? I mean, in terms of both finance and um, and and bodies? Uh, well, I, I can't quantify it in terms of either at the present moment, but the, the UK government has allocated, if I'm correct, three, three, three billion pounds. Um, and uh, the discussion, I think, is underway about what proportion of that can come to Scotland and how it will come to Scotland. Uh, I think Mr Mackay will be the right person to respond to that, and I will ask him to respond to the committee in terms of the resource that's available, uh, uh, so that you are aware of that. Okay, thank you. That will be useful. Any members have any further questions? No? Okay, Minister, um, can I just thank you and your officials for your time? Um, we've got a further meeting of this committee on Thursday. Uh, and we'll have uh, Chloe Smith and David Mundell in front of us. Um, so thank, thank you again, and uh, we'll uh, perhaps see you at some future stage. I fear uh, that may be the case. Thank yes. you very much. I'll suspend the meeting for a couple of minutes.